Good morning. Welcome everybody to our January 3rd Thursday webinar hosted by ProTech Equipment Resources, the electrical test and equipment rental experts. This is our first webinar for the year, uh, and this is a new series for us. We're going to host this series every third Thursday of each month at one o'clock Central Standard Time. We're excited to have so many people on this webinar, not just from the United States and Canada. We have people from Australia, from Chile, Germany, India, Philippines, Singapore, UAE, lots of different countries. So thank you for either staying up late or waking up early to join us as well today. My name is Matt Medinka, Director of Marketing, your MC for today's webinar, Medium Voltage Cable Tests and Diagnostics. This is part one of three, so make sure you register for the other two parts. We'll put the registration links in the chat at the end of the presentation. If you check the handout section, you'll also find that this presentation is in outline view in a PDF that you can download if you so choose. As a reminder, this presentation is not currently offered for continuing education units. However, we're working on that with NEDA and PE certifications. So save the certificates you're gonna get by email. Uh, after this presentation, we'll let you know when those credits are gonna become available. We're gonna try to retro this presentation as well. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, please send them through the questions tab and we'll try to address as many questions as possible at the end of the webinar. We've already noted your questions from your registrations and we'll go through those as well. You're gonna remain muted throughout the presentation, even in Q&A, so please use the questions function. We may not get to all the questions, so if you'd like to contact us after the event, please send your questions to marketing at protechequip.com and we'll make sure to get those answered for you. And you'll have contact information in your uh, follow-up email after the presentation. This webinar is free to watch, but please follow all industry and company policies, as well as safe safety procedures when performing live tests. Now, I'd like to introduce you to our presenter today. Many of you know him already. Tom Sandry is a 30-year industry veteran, starting off with an electrical manufacturer that is now known as Megger. Tom worked for ProTech for several years, uh, then for Shermco for the last nine years. Tom is back with us at ProTech, and we are happy to build additional learning tools and content for you this year to be able to increase your knowledge and perform your jobs effectively. Without further ado, here's Tom. Hey, thanks for that lead in, Matt. Yes, I am Tom Sandry, and our webinar is going to be Medium Voltage Cable Testing and Diagnostics. Hey, in this webinar series, we're going to discuss medium voltage electrical power cables, both the testing and the diagnostics. The topics that we're going to focus on will include cable deterioration, cable testing philosophies, understanding testing using direct current or DC. We're going to focus on high potential testing using direct current or DC, as well as power frequency 60 Hertz AC. And we will also discuss 0.1 Hertz, very low frequency VLF. We'll talk about tan delta testing and also partial discharge, both online and offline techniques. A power cable fails when local electrical stresses are greater than the local dielectric strength of the dielectric material or materials. Reliability and the rate of failure of the whole cabling system depend on the differences between the local stress and any given point in the system and the local strength at that point. A failure of the dielectric results in an electrical puncture or flashover at the location of the degraded dielectric. Now this flashover can occur between two dielectric surfaces, such as the cable insulation and joint insulation, or it can occur as an external flashover at the cable termination. Now, a cable failure can occur as a result of the normally applied 50, 60 Hertz voltage or during a transient voltage, such as a lightning or switching surge. 
as time progresses and the cable system ages, the bulk dielectric strength degrades. The main aging factor of extruded dielectric cable is electrical, although under abnormal situations, thermal aging can be significant. The electrical aging mechanisms, partial discharge, electrical treeing, water treeing, and charge injection occur at contaminants, defects, protrusions, and voids, and thus they tend to be localized. Okay, let's look at dry electrical deterioration. Looking at specific mechanisms, the excessive electrical stress or bulk deterioration of the insulation can occur as a result of any of the following. Manufacturing imperfections. These increase local stress, leading to either early failure or a higher rate of aging. Poor workmanship. Workmanship issues increase the local stress, leading to either early failure or high rates of aging. Voids or protrusions lead to partial discharge activity in the dielectric. This will erode the insulation and will lead to the inception and growth of electrical trees. The overall effect is a decrease in the dielectric strength of the insulation and eventual flashover and failure. These manufacturing imperfections can include voids that are left within the dielectric during the manufacturing process, contaminants in the insulation, poor application of shield material, protrusions on the shields, and poor application of the jackets. Now, among poor workmanship issues, we may have cuts that are left in the dielectric, contamination, missing applied components or connections, and misalignment of accessories. All right, now let's talk about thermal deterioration. Looking at specific mechanisms, the excessive electrical stress or bulk deterioration of overheating reduces the dielectric strength. The impact uh, can be restricted to short lengths if the adverse thermal environment is localized. Excessive conductor current for a given environment and operating condition will lead to a global deterioration of the cable. Poor thermal resistivity and proximity to other cable uh, circuits for short distances will lead to localized thermal deterioration. Now, abnormal temperature creates oxidation, decomposition, and evaporation in the dielectric. Thermal aging will lead to increased losses in the cable's dielectric, which can be seen in increased dissipation factor or tan delta uh, test results. Insulation resistance tests will show decreases in insulation resistance and overall dielectric strength will decrease. Typical causes of these thermal issues, excessive conductor current for a given environment and operating conditions poor thermal resistivity. Now, on our next one, let's talk about high density of small water trees. Wet environments can reduce the dielectric strength and increase the local stress. Small local activity can be seen in the formation of bow tie trees. Accumulation of small water trees will lead to increased cable losses and can be seen in increased dissipation factor or tan delta uh, test measurements. Dielectric strength will decrease as the aging progresses. 
Let's talk about large water trees. Water ingress reduces the dielectric strength and increases the stress in the area surrounding the moisture. Moisture ingress is caused by normal migration through polymeric materials or breaks in seals or jackets. Ingress will lead to the formation of large vented water trees, increased local electric field, and electrical tree formation. This will lead to increased cable losses and can be seen in increased dissipation factor or tan delta test measurements. Next, aggressive environment. Aggressive environments reduce the dielectric strength of the cable. The impact can be local if the uh, environmental influences are local. Causes can be chemical attacks, transformer oil leaks, fertilizers, floods, and petrochemical spills. And finally, let's talk about neutral corrosion. Unjacketed cable in soil that enhances copper corrosion, jacketed cable with corrosive chemical or water ingress will lead to the deterioration of the cable neutral. The loss of the neutral will lead to voltage rise at the cable surface and surface electrical discharges. This will create erosion and reduce dielectric strength. Now, Let's get into cable testing philosophies. Over the years, there have been several methods or uh, philosophies regarding the testing of underground electrical power cables in the field application. The Insulated Conductor Committee of the IEEE Power and Energy Society has divided the methods or the philosophies into two fundamental categories type one field tests and type two field tests. Type one tests are intended to detect defects in the insulation of the cable system in order to improve the service reliability after the defect uh, part is removed and appropriate repairs are performed. Now, these are usually achieved by application of moderately increased voltage across the insulation for a prescribed duration of time. Such as, uh, excuse me, such tests are categorized as pass fail. Tests include insulation resistance uh, testing. This is typically looked at as an under voltage test. DC high potential testing. This is described in IEEE document or IEEE standard 400.1, Guide for Field Testing of Laminated Dielectric Shielded Power Cable Systems Rated 5 kV and Above with High Direct Current Voltage. VLF high potential testing described in IEEE uh, standard 400.2, which is the guide for field testing of shielded power cable systems using very low frequency or VLF. And finally, high potential power frequency testing at 50, 60 Hertz. Now this is typically considered more of a factory test than a field test. Type Two tests are intended to provide indications that the insulation system has deteriorated. Hence, these are termed diagnostic tests. And these tests include dissipation factor or tan delta testing. This is described in IEEE standard 400.2, the guide for field testing of shielded power cable systems using very low frequency or VLF. We also have partial discharge testing, which is described in IEEE standard 400.3, the guide for partial discharge testing of shielded power cable systems in a field environment. 
and also we have damped alternating current or DAC. This is described in IEEE standard 400.4, guide for field testing of shielded power cable systems rated 5 kV and above with damped alternating current DAC voltage. Now, during this webinar series, we will explore the various philosophies and techniques commonly in practice in today's industry. Particular focus will be given to topics such as insulation resistance, DC high potential testing, very low frequency high potential testing, tan delta, and partial discharge testing both online and offline partial discharge techniques. So, for the purpose of these webinars, we will categorize cable testing into three areas. Installation tests. Field tests that are conducted after cable installation, but before splicing or terminating. These tests are intended to detect shipping, storage, or installation damage. Acceptance tests. These are field tests uh, after the cable installation, including splicing and termination, but before the cable system is placed into normal service. These tests are intended to further detect installation damage and to show any gross defects uh, or um, errors that may have occurred in the installation of the various system components. And finally, maintenance tests. These are field tests that are made during the operating life of a cable system. They are intended to detect deterioration of the system to check for serviceability so that suitable maintenance uh, procedures can be initiated. All right, let's look at under voltage testing with direct current. Under voltage tests performed with direct current or DC are typically performed with a test set referred to as a megometer. Since these tests use voltages under the rating of the insulation being tested, the test is considered to be non-destructive and does not produce any of the ill effects associated with high potential DC testing that we're going to be discussing later in this webinar. The traditional insulation resistance test is the simplest way to gain an overall indication of the condition of the insulation. Although the insulation resistance test can be applied as a simple type one or pass fail test, it can also be used to give more extensive diagnostic information. Type two or diagnostic insulation tests electrically stimulate the insulation and measure the response of the insulation to that stimulus. Depending upon the response, we can draw some conclusions about the condition or health of the insulation. Now, an insulation resistance tester or megometer is a portable instrument that provides a direct reading of insulation resistance in ohms, megohms, gigohms, or teraohms, regardless of the test voltage selected. For good insulation, the resistance usually reads in the megohms or higher ranges. An insulation resistance tester is essentially a high range resistance meter or ohm meter with a built in DC generator. The instrument's generator, which can be hand cranked, battery or line operated, develops a high DC voltage that causes several small currents to flow through and over surfaces of the insulation being tested. The total current is measured by the ohm meter, which has an analog indicating scale, a digital readout, or both. So let's talk about the components of the test current. Before the application of voltage, 
the two conducting plates or surfaces are electrically neutral. Once voltage is applied, then from the top plate, the electrons or the negative charge is attracted toward the positive terminal of the voltage source. Passing through the negative terminal of the voltage source, the electrons are pushed toward the bottom plate or surface of the specimen under test. Now, after a period of time, the top plate will have a uh, shortage of electrons, while the bottom plate will have excessive electrons. Or we can say the top plate will get positively charged, while the bottom plate will get negatively charged. Capacitive charging current is the current required to charge the capacitance of the insulation being tested. The current is initially large, but relatively short-lived, dropping exponentially to a value close to zero as the item under test is charged. Insulating material becomes charged in the same way as a dielectric in a capacitor. Next, let's discuss absorption current. Dielectric absorption current is the polarizing current that is drawn by the insulation system or dielectric to align the dipoles within the dielectric with the applied electric field. This current draws a high current initially, but then gradually drops off as the dipoles in the dielectric align to the plate potentials. Therefore, absorption current, which is the current that is being drawn into the insulation by the polarizing of the electrons, is initially high, but drops over time at a slower rate than the charging current. And then that brings us to the conductive or the leakage current. The conduction current or leakage current, which is a small and a steady state current that divides into two parts, the conduction path through the insulation and the current flowing over the surface of the insulation. Now that we better understand the components of the test current, let's talk a little bit about time resistance tests. A valuable property of insulation is that it charges during the course of a test. The polar DC field applied by the megometer causes realignment of the insulating material on a molecular level as dipoles orient themselves with the field. This movement of charge constitutes a current. Its value as a diagnostic indicator is based on two opposing factors. The current dies away as the structure reaches its final orientation, while leakage promoted by deterioration passes a comparatively large constant current. The net result is that with good insulation, leakage current is relatively small and resistance rises dramatically as charging goes to completion. This charging resistance provides diagnostic information related to the degree of degradation of insulation. Deteriorated insulation will pass relatively large amounts of leakage current at a constant rate for the applied voltage. This will flood out the charging effect and will show little or no change in the resistance value. Time resistance test methods take advantage of this charging effect. Graphing the resistance readings at time intervals from initiation of test yields a smooth rising curve for good insulation, but a flat graph for deteriorated insulation. The ultimate simplification of this technique is represented by the polarization index PI and the dielectric absorption DA tests. These require only two readings and a simple division. 
when performing the polarization index test, the one minute reading is divided into the 10 minute reading to provide a ratio. In dielectric absorption, the time values are typically 30 seconds and 60 seconds. Obviously, a low ratio indicates little change, hence poor or weak insulation, while a high ratio indicates the opposite. Spot readings alone can be difficult to work with, as they may range from enormous values in new cable down to a few megohms just before the cable is removed from service. A test like polarization index is particularly useful because it can be performed on even the longest of cables and yields a self-contained evaluation based on relative readings rather than absolute values. All right. Let's move on and let's talk about high potential testing. Now, you have been asked to perform a high potential or high pot test on some service age cable, or possibly you are asking for a high potential test to be performed on service age cable. What should you know before proceeding? Should the test be performed using direct current DC? or should it be performed with alternating current, AC? What is the goal of the test? What time duration should you use to accomplish this goal? Can you explain why to these preceding questions? Have you heard or perhaps told some of these statements regarding high voltage testing of power cables? DC testing is a destructive test. Very low frequency VLF testing is non-destructive. Cable manufacturers say it's acceptable to test with DC. My cable may fail during the test. Point 0.1 Hertz is not really AC. You know, we can reduce stress and not fail the cable if we reduce the test duration. Are these statements true, partially true, or maybe just a myth? Well, before delving into the truth, the half truth, and myths associated with high potential testing of electrical power cables, let's ask ourselves a simple question. What is high potential testing and why do we want to perform a high potential test in the first place? What do we want to accomplish? Now, many people are familiar with a continuity test. A continuity test checks for good connections, meaning current will flow from one point to its destination point. If current flows easily enough, then the points are connected properly. Many people are somewhat less familiar with the high potential or high voltage test. In the most basic terms, a high potential or high pot test checks for good isolation. A high pot test checks that no current flows between points where there should be no current. In some ways, a high pot test is the opposite of a continuity test. When performing a continuity test, our goal is to make sure current flows easily from one point to another point. When performing a high potential test, our goal is to make sure current does not flow between points where there should be no flow, and we use high voltage to ensure current does not flow. A high pot test takes two conductors that should be isolated and applies a high voltage between the conductors. The current uh, flow is watched. If too much current flows, the points are not well isolated and they fail the test. So what is the intent or goal of testing? What type of voltage sources are available to perform this test? 
are there disadvantages and limitations associated with the type of test voltages? Well, let's start with what is the intent of high potential testing? The IEEE standard 400-2001 guide for field testing and evaluation of insulation of shielded power cable systems begins with an overview describing the omnibus nature of the document and further categorizes tests into two types with specific goals. Type 1 field tests are intended to detect defects in the insulation of a cable system in order to improve the service reliability after the defective part is removed and appropriate repairs are performed. These tests are usually achieved by application of moderately increased voltage across the insulation for a prescribed duration. Such tests may be categorized as pass-fail or simple go-no-go. -no -go. Type 2 field tests are intended to provide indications that the insulation system has deteriorated Hence, these are diagnostic. Some of these tests will show the overall condition of a cable system, and others will indicate the location of discrete defects that may become the site of future service failures. Both varieties of such tests are usually performed by means of moderately increased voltage applied for relatively short duration or by means of low voltages. A key point to note in type one testing is the statement, are intended to detect defects in the insulation of the cable system in order to improve the service reliability after the defective part is removed and appropriate repairs are performed. Now, this is in contrast with type 2 testing, where the intent is to provide indications that the insulation system has deteriorated. As we can see in the description of the intents, the term destructive is somewhat subjective. For example, when performing a dielectric withstand test or simply a high pot test, we are looking to answer the question, will this cable withstand a required voltage for a required period of time? To answer this question, the test applies the required high voltage for a determined amount of time and watches the current flow through that insulation. Ideally, negligible current flows and the cable is not harmed. However, if a defect exists within the cable, by definition, a type 1 test, such as a withstand test, has the intent to detect the defect and improve the service reliability after that defective part is removed and repaired. So, as we can see, all dielectric withstand or high potential testing is potentially destructive to a cable if there is a defect in the cable. The test will not significantly alter the quality of a cable with no defect, but it will by intent detect a defect and drive a defective cable into failure. Now, for years, DC testing has been the traditionally accepted method for judging the serviceability of medium voltage cables. Direct current tests have worked well for conducting high potential and condition assessment tests on paper insulated lead covered or PILC cable. When plastic insulated cables were first introduced in the 1960s, DC continued to be the preferred method. 
as time moved on, plastic insulated cable uh, became more abundant and began to begin showing effects of service age. Direct current continued to be the dominant test, but concerns began to grow over the effectiveness of this test. In the early 1990s, reports started to surface indicating that DC high potential testing could be the blame for latent damage experienced by extruded medium voltage cable insulation, particularly cross-link polyethylene and ethylene propylene rubber. Now, after receiving these reports, the Electrical Power Research Institute, EPRI, funded a study relating to cross-link polyethylene, XLPE, and ethylene propylene rubber, EPR cables. This two-part study, EPRI Report TR 101245, yielded the following conclusions regarding cross-link polyethylene cable. One. The report concluded DC high potential testing of field age cable reduces its life. Secondly, DC high potential testing is ineffective as a maintenance tool. Third, the report concluded DC high potential testing before energizing new medium voltage cable does not cause any reduction in cable life. Now the EPRI report also provided the following recommendations. To be safe, it is recommended not to conduct any DC testing at 40 kV or corresponding to a stress of 228 volt per mil on a cross-link polyethylene insulated cable in service. DC testing can be done up to 55 kV in the field on an unaged cable never been in service. To better understand the conclusions of the EPRI study, it is beneficial to once again review the aging characteristics of extruded dielectric cables and the process of water treeing. Water trees begin to form when a cable is exposed to water and normal operating voltage over an extended period of time. Electrical forces acting on water molecules, electrophoresis, at a microscopic point within the insulation increases the separation between polymer units. These water droplets become oriented into a chain-like channel. The result is a sharp electrode producing highly localized stresses. Once treeing is initiated, an electrical stress exists from the base of the tree channel to its extremity. When high levels of DC voltage are impressed on a solid extruded polymeric materials, their good electrical insulation properties become degraded. For example, trapped or low mobility electrically charged species within the bulk can give rise to space charge, resulting in localized electrical stress enhancement. This can cause further concentration of charge and accelerated electrical aging. The water tree part contains more ionic impurities than the sound part of the insulation. It is therefore likely that in crossing polyethylene cable under high voltage DC stress, the space charge are formed in the water tree region and its vicinity, promoting an increase in water tree growth and reduction of service life. Now, let's break this down with a simple analogy. DC or direct current is unidirectional. So let's look at the cable and let's think of Manhattan, New Jersey and the Lincoln Tunnel. Based on our image, we're going to have the island of Manhattan, which is going to be the conductor. 
and we're going to have the shoreline of New Jersey, which will be our concentric neutral. And we're going to talk about building the Lincoln Tunnel. Now, did you know that back in the 1930s, all construction vehicles like dump trucks and so forth were DC vehicles, meaning that they only had forward gears and no reverse? So the day starts as usual. The construction vehicles start going into the tunnel. But at the end of the day, how do we get the vehicles out of the tunnel? They don't have reverse gears. They become trapped, sort of like a low mobility or space charge stuck in a tree, or in this case, stuck in the Lincoln Tunnel. They are unable to get out. Now, we have this space charge trapped inside of the tree, but we want to put it back into service, so we apply power frequency, and as the AC goes into the cable, the little DC trap charge rises up on the crest of the AC and is sort of the equivalent of all those trucks that are stuck in the Lincoln Tunnel. And along comes a bulldozer, slams into the back of the last truck, pushing everyone forward and accelerates the growth of the tunnel. Well, or accelerates the growth of the channel in this case. Now, and I know that's not a proper engineering description of space charge, but hopefully it helps put a little bit of an image in your mind. In 1996, a few years after the EPRI reports, the Insulated Conductor Committee determined that DC high potential testing of the plastic or crosslink polyethylene insulation systems was detrimental to the life of the insulation and therefore discontinued recommending DC testing for plastic or crosslink polyethylene insulation systems. In 2001, a new IEEE guide for field testing and evaluation of the insulation of shielded power cable systems, IEEE standard 4000 2001 was released. The new standard included statements such as testing of cables that have been aged in a wet environment, specifically crosslink polyethylene, with DC at the currently recommended DC voltages may cause the cable to fail after they are returned to service. These failures would not have occurred at that point in time if the cables had remained in service and had not been tested with DC. This standard also indicated other testing has shown that even massive insulation defects in extruded dielectric insulation cannot be detected with DC at the recommended voltage levels. Now, laminated insulation systems are not subject to the same aging characteristics as extruded dielectrics such as XLPE and EPR. Therefore, DC testing is more accepted for acceptance and maintenance testing of paper insulated lead covered or PILC cable. And we see this reflected in IEEE standard 400.1 which is the guide for testing laminated dielectric shielded power cable systems rated 5 kV and above with high direct current voltage. So keep in mind, however, the test has limitations. The DC leakage can be affected by external factors such as heat, humidity, and water level if unshielded and in ducts or conduits. It can also be affected by internal heating if the cable under test has recently been heavily loaded. Now these factors make comparison of periodic uh, data obtained under different test conditions very difficult. In practice, the shape of the leakage curve 
assuming constant voltage, is more important than either the absolute leakage current or absolute insulation resistance of a go-no-go -no -go withstand test result. Now, current versions of most industry recommendations no longer include DC high potential testing of extruded cables such as the cross-link polyethylene and EPR as a maintenance test. Of those that still do, all have reduced the recommended uh, test durations from 15 minutes down to only five minutes. None of the standards endorse DC high potential testing as a factory test for extruded cables, but most documents continue to include DC high potential testing as an acceptance test only on newly installed extruded cables. These industry recommendations and guides also no longer endorse DC high potential testing as a maintenance test for extruded cables that have been in service for more than five years. So let's talk about DC installation and acceptance tests. This test is performed to detect any defect in cable insulation, splices and terminations, which may result from poor workmanship or mechanical damage. DC testing is not expected to reveal deterioration due to aging in service. This proof test confirms the integrity of the insulation and accessories before the cable is put into service. Tests are recommended during installation at the DC test voltages specified in the table shown, applied for 15 consecutive minutes. Always check with the cable manufacturer at the following stages. Immediately after the cable is placed, this would be referred to as the installation test. After the cable splicing and termination has been performed, but before energizing, this is the acceptance test. Now, maintenance tests after installation using DC. After the cable has been completely installed and placed in service, a DC proof test may be made at any time within the first five years at a voltage not exceeding the DC test voltage specified in the table shown under the first five years column and applied for five consecutive minutes. After that time, DC testing is not recommended for extruded dielectrics. That concludes our webinar, part one. Hope to see you come back and join us when we cover uh, cable testing and diagnostics, part two, where we will pick up where we left off and discuss AC high potential testing, both power frequency and at 0.1 Hertz VLF. And we will also discuss the tan delta test in our part two of this series. For now, we will be monitoring for questions and answers. Uh, and after this is posted uh, online, we will also check for questions and answers for some period after posting. I hope you found benefit in this uh, webinar and again, hope to see you on the next one. Okay, hey, thanks everybody. Uh, if you wanna stay on for uh, another 10 minutes, we're gonna take some Q&A. We have about 15 or 16 questions. Um, so I think um, we're gonna cover some of those. Uh, right, Tom, are you? I am on and waiting for the questions, Matt. All right, perfect, let's fire away. Question one, I'm just gonna kind of show it like this in, in my PowerPoint slides here. Um, these were all pre-sent in. If you have a question that you want us to answer live, just put it in the questions. Um, click on that little tab that says questions and ask away. Um, okay, so we've got a few in there actually. Um, let's start with one of those. Um, does the same concerns expressed for high potential apply to megohm meter testing? Uh, generally, no. 
keep in mind when we're talking about mega meter testing, mega testing, insulation resistance testing, whatever terminology we're comfortable with. Normally, like on a let's say 15 kV rated cable, 25 kV rated cable, 35 kV rated cable, and so on, the megometer is typically limited to only applying maybe 5 kV maximum. Yes, I do know that there are some megometers out there that uh, in modern market uh, might produce a little bit higher voltages. But traditionally speaking, the megometer is an under voltage test, well under the operating voltage levels of the cable specimen. So even if there are the water trees that are in there, uh, even through the uh, electrophoresis that we talked about and the aligning of the water molecules at this under voltage level, uh, it's really not putting the stress uh, at those local regions as when we do a withstand or high potential test at the DC, which would commonly be at voltages well above operating level. So we do still look at the megometer, the uh, uh, megohm readings as a relatively safe under voltage test, not carrying the ill effects of the DC high voltage withstand. Great. Okay. Thanks, uh, George Flachos, for asking that question. Okay. Let's go with some of the um, questions that were asked uh, pre webinar here. So we got our first one up here. This was asked by uh, Russell from ABM. Uh, insulation resistance testing versus high pot at 2.5 kV. Can we high pot cables older than five years? I know we hit on that just a little bit while ago. Uh, do you want to expand on that? Absolutely. First, let's address insulation resistance testing versus the high pot. Um, from my days in the field, uh, I never put uh, any type of elevated voltage on a service age cable until first doing an insulation resistance test. Now I would do the test and I would be interested in what the mega ohm reading was, but keep in mind that the mega ohm reading can be very difficult to interpret. The longer the cable length, technically the more parallel pass for leakage current. So a three mile length cable, uh, you know, would measure one mega ohm value. And with the exact same dielectric, uh, if we were to half the cable, it would read a higher value simply because the longer the cable gets there's more uh, parallel leakage paths so you would always need to put a correction factor for length in order to get some type of good usable absolute resistance value the time-based test is where i found the most valuable because first thing i would do is do an insulation resistance polarization index test and really i didn't care about absolute readings i was watching that capacitive charge and current and absorption current deplete watching the mega ohm reading rise, 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 rise. As long as I had a good rising edge and I had a good, uh, you know, one minute to 10 minute ratio, I knew that putting the high voltage onto it probably was not going to render a lot of problems. I wasn't seeing contamination in the specimen. So now I would go ahead and do the over voltage or the high potential test. Now, going back to the question, the way it's worded, older than five years. Now, if we were running the test at alternating current, remember that Lincoln Tunnel and those 1930 vintage dump trucks that had no reverse gears? Hey, guess what? When VLF came out into the market or if we're dealing with alternating current, the trucks have a reverse. So there is no low mobility space charge left behind in these channels anymore when we're doing AC. Basically, truck goes in, hits reverse, truck goes out, or charge goes in, charge goes out. So the statement of five years only applies when we're talking about direct current high pot. And the reason for the five years is the Installated Conductor Committee and EPRI kind of came to the conclusion that on average, it takes about five years of service life before an extruded dielectric cable would start to materialize water train issues. Now, even this though, take with a bit of grain of salt because crossing polyethylene has gone through three distinctive evolutions, uh, going back to the original crossing polyethylenes of the 60s and 70s. In the mid 80s, we had the high molecular weight crossing polyethylenes, which helped 
mitigate a lot of the terrain process. And the most recent, we have the TR XLPEs or the tree retardants, which uh, even further mitigate the terrain process. So the five years, one might argue that we could open it up a little bit for uh, the TR XLPEs, but I go back to one of the original rulings of the uh, Insulated Conductor Committee. DC, as a field test, has seen its day. For extruded dielectrics, there are better methods, VLF testing, where we're now using AC. We're not creating these localized stress areas or aligning these water channels uh, and growing tree formations. Um, we're stressing the insulation more uniformly. Uh, so the ICC kind of concluded where if you look at the current IEEE standard 400, the only place high voltage DC is even referenced is only for oil pregnant lead covered or laminated insulating systems. As far as extruded dielectrics, it's a thing of the past. IEEE doesn't recognize it to be used at all, new or service age. However, if you look at the NEDA guides, uh, where I use one of their reference tables for the DC, they go back to the original statement that brand new EPRI determined that this will not alter the life expectancy of the cable up to the first five years. After five years, reality is if you probably have water treeing and you should just say no to DC high potting. So, very long-winded, but hopefully that gave you a good detail answer. <laughs> awesome, thank you. That was for Russell from uh, ABM. Uh, just real quick in the chat, uh, there's the links to our next four webinars for the next four months, uh, February through May. Uh, our part two of this series is going to be in March and the wrap up part three is going to be in May. So those links are there for you. We'll also email them out, put them on our LinkedIn so you guys We'll have access to be able to register that. Just remember, it's always the first Thursday, or sorry, the third Thursday of every month. Uh, we got a few minutes left. Let's uh, get into a few more questions here. Understand you guys may need to hop off as needed. Go ahead, stay on as well if you want to uh, keep listening to the Q&A. Uh, next question. Uh, this is from uh, Kong Lee. DC testing as per IEEE 400 bundles, especially for service of aged EPR MV cables. Okay, and I kind of touched on this in my last long-winded answer. Um, in the IEEE 400 bundles, you have the IEEE 400-2001, uh, which basically just is an introduction. Uh, it talks about all the different uh, um, documents that are gonna be part of the series. Uh, tries to give a brief overview of the benefits and limitations of each. Um, where you really get into the heart of the 400 bundle is when you start now going into like 400.1, where it talks about DC high pot testing, but as the title states, only for laminated dielectrics, not for your EPRs, not for your uh, PEs and your uh, XLPEs not for any extruded dielectric. Now, when you go into like 400.2, which is very low frequency, uh, VLF, which is AC alternating current, now you start seeing all of the references of high potting going back to those extruded dielectrics. So as far as the IEEE 400 bundle is concerned, the only place high voltage DC still remains is only on those laminated cables. Once you get into the EPRs and once you get into the uh, crosslink polys, VLF testing uh, is what's mentioned in the guides. Okay, great. Hey, we got a couple of questions that are just in the question. I know a lot of hands were flying up. Let's post them in the questions. Let's kind of pivot back to those with the people online, see if we could answer some of their questions too. Uh, in which voltage range can this test be done? Um, this is uh, from uh, Fatina Abedini. Um, um, do you know which test he was talking about, Tom? I'm gonna to assume since the nature of the topics have been really focusing toward that high voltage DC, I'm gonna 
uh, assume that that's where uh, the reference is. So in which voltage range can this test be done? Um, hopefully you went ahead and got yourself a copy of the handout. Um, I would encourage you to go to that one slide where I talk about high voltage DC testing still being used for installation, acceptance, and maintenance. Because the table there gives a consensus of the current modern day recommended voltage levels based on voltage class of cable and also gives recommendation of time duration. The big warnings in the EPRI though, uh, and I would encourage that is a free download off of uh, the internet. So again, get that handout, get that uh, TR number for the EPRI report, get yourself a free copy of it to read up uh, more on their final conclusions. But if, if you really turn back the hands of time to when we looked at the original DC testing of the original IEEE 400 document, DC, we would be literally putting it on cables uh, two and a half times, three times, four times, even sometimes up to six times uh, operating voltage phase to ground in order to simulate the same level of stress that an alternating current would have applied to the uh, this is one of the reasons why we see verbiage now in the new IEEE's uh, to the effect of DC is not effective uh, in uh, testing where here's something you can do at your own labs take a length of extruded dielectric cable maybe you know, 20 feet, 30 feet. Take a nail and drive a spike all the way down to the conductor. Pull the nail out, leaving a dry hole. Apply a high pot, DC high pot to it or a megometer to it. You will measure high insulation resistance and it will hold voltage very well. Put a little bit of contamination in that hole that you created, like a little bit of moisture. Then it will flash over very quickly. So, DC, one of the things is when there's not contamination or anything in the cable, a dry cavity fault, you have to hit it with a tremendously high DC value to get it to break down and show itself as a failure point. Where alternating current stresses the insulation more uniformly and will break down a dry cavity fault or a wet contaminated uh, um, channel very efficiently which is again, one of the reasons why Insulated Conductor Committee and the IEEE just decided to just say no to DC high potting when it came to extruded dielectrics. Great, okay. Uh, another live question uh, from Travis Langer. How does the VLF machine calculate tan delta numbers? Ah, I'm gonna bring you back to your days of ninth grade trigonometry. <laughs> I mean, really, when you talk about uh, power factor, dissipation factor, tan delta, really what you're looking at is um, in a perfect uh, insulating system, theoretic perfect insulating system, when you apply potential, all you would have uh, flowing through it is charging current. During the first half cycle, you know, all of those electrons want to get to the, you know, plate that is the positive plate, or excuse me, all those electrons want to get to that plate that's the negative plate. Um, during the next half cycle, they want to reverse and go back to the other plate. So in a theoretical perfect insulating system, the only current that would be flowing would be that of charging current, okay? But in reality, the materials that we use have a thing called dielectric losses, the losses that are natural to the materials that are being used. The losses are resistive current, okay? Now, capacitive charging current leads the voltage by perfect 90 degrees. The resistive current is in line with the voltage, therefore, the charging current leads the resistive current by 90 degrees. The actual total current that is flowing when you apply uh, your VLF or your AC voltage is the total current is gonna be made up of the capacitive current, 
the good stuff that we want to see, and the resistive current, the losses associated with the material. Therefore, your angle, since they're at two different vectors, one is at 90, one is at zero, your new angle for your total current can no longer be 90 degrees. It's going to be some point less than 90 degrees. And by using trigonomic functions, looking for the angle of the tangent delta, uh, we can determine that loss angle. Or more simply put, we basically look at like capacitive uh, current divided by resistive current, and that ratio becomes that tan delta number that we analyze. The bigger the uh, number gets, that tells us that we're getting more losses in the cable. So now it's just not the standard dielectric losses, but it could be carbon uh, tracking getting in there, moisture contamination, but we're altering the di uh, dielectric losses, we're increasing the losses, causing that angle to increase. But we are going to be covering that in much, much more detail in part two of this series. Awesome. Um, okay, let's. There, I got one more live question, then I'm going to go back to one of the, this next uh, pre-ordered question. Um, so James Altenoff has asked, are there any concerns about generating x-rays when testing cables, similar to concerns when testing vacuum circuit breakers with DC? Uh, that, that's a very good, very good question, uh, James. And uh, glad to see that you're reading uh, um, your uh, uh, test sheets and everything uh, well. Um, no, the x-rays are something that are unique to vacuum interrupters. Uh, the problem would not be there for the uh, dielectrics in a, uh, in a cable. However, from a safety standpoint, James, one of the big issues that you have with applying DC to long lengths of cable, you don't need to worry about those x-rays, but that big long length of cable, you've got a conductor, you've got a metallic uh, shield, you've got a dielectric in the middle, you basically have a capacitor. The larger the cable and the longer it is, the more capacitance you have. So as you're applying your test voltage, energy is being stored in that cable. You don't need to worry about those x-rays, but if you grab that lead, after the test voltage has been removed and you did not discharge all that store energy, it will give you a shock that will knock you across the room and hopefully you survive it. So don't worry about those x-rays, but never forget a cable is a huge capacitor and it will store a DC charge. You have to discharge it before you can handle it. That's actually a really good lead in to this next question. This was asked by uh, Richard Shipley from EPS. How does cable capacitance affect a cable test in DC versus AC cable testing? Okay, one from the safety factor, uh, Richard, uh, your DC uh, will be stored in the cable. So many of the modern day DC high potential test sets are on the market. When you hit the stop button, it kicks in a discharge circuit and will begin to drain that stored charge. But know the equipment you're using. Some of the early ones did not have this feature and you actually had to use an external discharge stick uh, to reduce that charge. You may also uh, see some of the early literature uh, going back to the original IEEE 400 series um, where it would say literally you would have to discharge the DC uh, two times, four times, six times uh, the time that you applied it. The problem with the DC and a large bulk of insulation is it takes a long time to get all of the charges out of it. Uh, the uh, capacitive charge drops relatively quickly when you discharge, but all those dipoles that are in the insulation and the more insulation, the more dipoles. Your depolarization of the insulation takes an extensive amount of time. One phenomenon that you may discover sometimes with the DC testing is you go ahead and you remove the voltage, you short the cable out, you remove the short circuit and the cable starts to recharge itself. Those dipoles start gradually reorienting themselves again. 
So you get a thing called relaxation current. DC is very, very dangerous when working with big, long lengths of cable. So always make sure that you discharge, make sure that you have your static grounds and you ground those conductors and you keep that cable grounded until you absolutely have to uh, either test or put it back into service. Keep that uh, capacitive charge off by just keeping it grounded. Now, alternating current, less dangerous because every half cycle, the polarity is changing. So again, you're not holding a charge when you're using uh, alternating current. However, at VLF, we are going down to like 0.1 hertz. So the potential of ending the test and leaving a remaining charge still exists. So that's first part of the answer to Richard's question. Second part, the effective cable capacitance, AC versus DC, really affects the test set. And we're gonna talk a lot about this in part two of this series. When we have alternating current, we can have alternating current at power frequency, 60 Hertz, okay? Now let's say I have a 1000 foot length of cable, 15 kV cable, 1000 feet in length. That may equal about one microfarad of capacitance. If I were to do the mathematics to calculate how much volt amps my test set would have to put out in order to charge that much capacitance to, let's say, a value of 22,000 volts, as I would go through those calculators or calculations, I would basically come to the conclusion that I would need a very large AC transformer with you know, a few thousand volt amps in order to meet my goal. So now I have a big, heavy test set I have to carry out the field. By slowing the frequency down to 0.1 hertz and charging slowly, I reduce the VA draw on the test set, making it smaller, lighter weight, and more affordable. The birth of VLF test sets. Now, when you look at DC, it may take me three, four minutes of charging it with a megometer uh, in order to get to a stabilized reading to get over the capacitive charging current. But since I'm charging it slowly, time is not a factor. I don't pull a lot of volt amps off the power supply and megometers are battery operated. So several ways of answering your question, Richard. Fantastic. Thanks, Tom. Uh, and just to be mindful of everybody's time, I mean, we almost still have 100 people <laughs> listening. So that's great that everybody's interested uh, in staying on for this Q&A. But we got 10 more questions to answer. Uh, and uh, I know we have a hard stop coming up pretty soon. So let's answer one more and then we'll figure out how to get everybody else's questions answered. And some of those we're going to cover in part two anyway. So uh, let's do one more. And this is from Sylvester Jones. Uh, of uh, Metro Power, and he asked if uh, owner wants to uh, DC high pot test existing cables, what is an accurate test voltage to be used without damaging the cable further? Uh, okay, first thing, um, I, I would always, you know, try to have dialogue with the cable owner, okay, uh, particularly when it comes to DC testing. Hopefully, download a copy of this presentation that might act as some good talking points that you can sit down and discuss with the owner. Um, if it is a service age cable, honestly, you'd be best to talk them out of doing any type of high voltage DC, move to the world of VLF, uh, move to the diagnostic techniques of uh, TAN Delta. I think they will find at the end of the day they are the ones that are really going to accomplish what their goal is. Because most times with a service age cable, I don't want to put any undue stress. I don't want to grow any defect to failure. I just want to know how much contamination do I have in there? And should I be concerned? So the TAN Delta test is like the most superior to answer that question. Um, and that's the point of our discussions in, the, in part two of this series. But if they do insist that they want a DC high pot test performed on a surface age cable, again, make sure that they are fully aware of the five year warning that after five years, you may have a lot of water treating in there and this can accelerate 
uh, the uh, deterioration of your cable and have it fail prematurely than if you just don't test it at all. Um, now, the uh, voltage guide that I gave in that handout, that was taken. Uh, you'll see that on Okanite's website, unless they've taken it down. Um, and you'll also find that in the NEDA uh, acceptance testing manuals and the NEDA maintenance testing manuals. But there's your recommendation for voltages based on voltage class cable and time durations. Awesome. Thanks, Tom. Uh, somebody submitted this. That was great. I think it's a good, good lead in to wrap up. Uh, none. Very new to the topic. Just want to listen and learn. So I hope you guys have learned a lot today. Uh, I know there's still 10 questions we haven't got to. Uh, I apologize for now. Time on that. Sylvester, Adam, Ronald, Chuck, Matthew, Jake, Amjad, George, Juan, Nick, uh, Raj, Sergio, Devin. We'll follow up with you and get your questions answered. And we'll probably use some of them on our next uh, part two. So thank you so much. Again, check the chat really quick before we sign off. If you want to sign up for next month or part two of this, we'll stay in touch, get the links out to you guys. And uh, you'll get a follow-up email. If you have any other questions, uh, just email marketing uh, or email Tom and uh, we'll get those answered for you. Thanks again. And uh, we will see you next month. Thank you, everybody. Enjoyed having you.